So Good Dog is on a mission to build a better world for our dogs and the people who love them by advocating for responsible dog breeders, educating the public, and promoting canine health and responsible dog ownership through responsible dog ownership through events just like this. We're a secure online community that is created just for dog breeders, and we are completely free for dog breeders as well. We use the power of technology to help good breeders successfully run their breeding programs from start to finish with tools like our secure payment system to protect you from scams, our best-in-class software to post your available litters, start connecting with good dog buyers, and find great homes for your pups, ultimately. Plus, we offer free breeder, breeder business resources, that's always a mouthful to say, um, such as webinars about navigating taxes as a dog breeder, um, and how they relate to dog breeders, search engine optimization, business insurance, and so much more. So if you are not yet a member of our community, we would absolutely love to have you join. And you can apply to join at gooddog.com slash join, which we will drop in the chat for anyone who is interested in joining us. And I want to share a little bit more about Dr. Smith before I pass things over to her um, to start the presentation. So Dr. Smith became a diplomat of the College of Theriogenology in 1986. Since that time, she's been in the private practice as a small animal practitioner specializing in canine reproduction. Dr. Smith is one of very few board certified theriogenologists, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, in private practice. Her expertise in genetic counseling, children frozen semen, and reproductive infertility of male and female canines is known throughout the United States. Dr. Smith frequently speaks to breed groups, veterinary associations, and students, and the general public. Dr. Smith retired from full-time practice in March of 2023, but maintains licenses in Minnesota, Mississippi, and Colorado. Dr. Smith grew up in a military family that bred German Shepherd dogs. Her commitment to veterinary medicine began at seven years of age and was confirmed in her high school yearbook, which slated her goal was the patter of 40 little feet, not human. I love that. <laughs> um, so with that, I will pass things off to you, Dr. Smith, to start the presentation. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with you today. <clears throat> Nicole did a great job. Theriogenology is a very awkward word. But the reality is the specialty is a combination of what in human medicine would be um, urology and obstetrics and gynecology. So we deal with boy stuff and girl stuff and the combination of the two stuff is the best way I can sum that up. I'm delighted to talk to you today. And I'm also delighted that Serena sponsors these presentations for you. Nothing is more important other than in combination with your genetic selection than good nutrition to produce healthy, happy puppies. So as Nicole said, I am a boarded theriogenologist. Theriogenology is a specialty. It is distinct from the Society for Theriogenology, which I think we should understand. It is a board certified group, which means that you have multiple years of training beyond veterinary school. We have a lot of veterinarians in the United States that do a great job in reproduction who are members of the SFT, the Society for Theriogenology. But membership in that organization does not imply that you have had additional training, just that you have great interest and oftentimes a lot of self-taught and additionally taught seminars and learning how to do things right. So we have some great SFT members as well. In the entire college of theriogenology, there are three under 300 diplomates. All right, so I'm a veterinarian with a specialty in theriogenology. I'm also the president of the OFA the Canine Health Information System, which is the world's largest animal health database. I'm the president of the Labrador Retriever Club Incorporated and the health chairperson for the club. And I'm a dog breeder of Labrador Retrievers under the registered name Danik. People ask me how I came up with the name Danik. It's a combination of my two children's names, Dana and Nick. I knew while I might not succeed in a first marriage, my kids' names wouldn't change, and it was a good thing I picked kids' names. I am an AKC-approved judge for hunting retriever tests and field trials, a published author of peer-reviewed publications, including book chapters and scientific papers. Even though I'm retired, I just 
did another book chapter. And every time I write one, because I dislike writing, I say it will be my last. And I did develop the surgical technique for frozen semen insemination. Um, so I want to talk to you about AFCO, because AFCO is really important for you to understand when you are looking at food. AFCO is the Association of American Feed Control Officials. It's private. It's a not profit voluntary membership association. The people in this organization are charged with regulating the sale and distribution of animal feeds including dog food and drug remedies. AFCO establishes standard ingredient definitions and nutritional requirements for pet foods. AFCO does not directly test, regulate, approve, or certify pet foods. AFCO establishes guidelines for ingredient definitions, product labels, feeding trials, and laboratory analysis of nutrients that go into pet food. Third-party testing is performed for analysis of these foods. So pet food labels. Before we can talk too much about food itself, you need to understand how to read a pet food label. And before we get way into this, then it may actually save us some questions at the end of this talk, although I love questions. I should tell you that I am absolutely not a fan of any raw food diet. And in my practice years, I will tell you that I would not accept a client, well, the client's dogs actually, but the clients pay the bills as a patient if they were going to feed raw foods to their pregnant dogs. It is nigh on to impossible to assure nutritional completeness. And it also can be a huge source of pathogens to the bitch and her puppies and all types of in utero effects. Now, the raw people are not going to like me to say that, but we'll get that out of the way and that's all done. So now let's get back to our labels. The pet food label is labeled with the product and the brand name. <clears throat> The species of animal that will be fed the food. Dog food should say dog food. Cat food will say cat food. I also have horses and other species. And there are kind of several foods for those animals that are all stock. You can feed them to cattle, sheep, horses, et cetera, et cetera. Most of our small animal food is specifically labeled to be fed to the species for which it's intended. People ask me all the time or did ask me all the time, will it hurt my cat if it eats the dog food? No. Will it hurt my dog if the dog eats the cat food? No. But a cat fed strictly dog food will not be getting all of the taurine requirements that it needs. So feed it to the species for which it's labeled. The net quantity in the bag, what the guaranteed analysis is, the ingredient list and the ingredients are listed. The first ingredient listed on the label is the most prevalent ingredient. And as you go further and further down the list, that gives you an idea of the amount of each that is in it. Whoops, I want to go back there. Nutritional adequacy statement, et cetera. Uh, so AFCO does not directly test regulate or certify pet foods. It establishes guidelines for ingredient definitions, product labels, feeding trials, and laboratory analysis of nutrients that go into pet food. Third-party testing is performed for analysis of these foods. So pet food labels, again, you want to look for the product and brand name, the species of animal, net quantity, guaranteed analysis, Ingredient list, the nutritional adequacy statement is very important. It will say typically complete and balanced statement. And then we will talk about complete and balanced statement for different lifestyles, feeding directions, and then of course, the name and location of the manufacturer. The FDA makes sure that the ingredients used in the food are safe and have a purpose in pet food. The 
FDA requires that there is proper identification of the product, the net quantity, the name and location of the manufacturer or distributor, and property, proper listing of all ingredients in order of the prevalence in the food. So for instance, some of the foods on the market now contain things like blueberries and cranberries and some, some of what I will call designer foods contains things like guava, et cetera, et cetera. If they're safe, it's okay. It doesn't mean that they are necessary or beneficial. So the AFPO statement is the gold standard for this. The statement explained whether the food contains essential nutrients, how that was determined, and for which life stage the food is appropriate for. The food is, in, is complete and balanced for a particular life stage. A very common question I would get as a practicing veterinarian is, do I really need to feed my puppy puppy food? Well, the answer to that is you either need puppy food, which is formulated for growth of puppies and is balanced for their growth, or you need to food, feed a food that is labeled for all life stages. I want to stress to all of you that adult maintenance is intended for the average, I don't even wanna call them backyard dog, I'll call it, say it a house dog, who lives in the house, goes for a brief walk a couple of times a day, sleeps on the couch, and its big excitement in life is maybe a Frisbee toss at a dog park one or two times a week. That's adult maintenance. Otherwise, the two life stages are this adult maintenance where you're having a pretty dull but wonderful loved life and growth and reproduction. Adult maintenance foods are designed for adult dogs. Growth and reproduction foods are designed for puppies and pregnant or lactating females. A new guideline for the puppy foods on our market includes a statement about large dogs, which is those over 70 pounds at maturity, with adjustments to calcium and phosphorus ratio. So again, getting back to the question about puppies, clients would say, well, won't the puppy foods make my puppy grow too rapidly? The answer to that is no. They will allow appropriate growth with appropriate nutrient levels so that calcium, phosphorus, and other minerals, as well as protein and fat, are adequate and help you to grow a nice, healthy puppy that is neither too thin or too fat or grows too rapidly. Foods that are marked marketed for all life stages must meet the more stringent standards of growth and reproduction. As you might expect, foods that are all life stages or for growth and reproduction typically tend to be more expensive because of the components that go into them to meet these requirements. Um, again, remember the all life stages designation is not an AFCO designation. Nutritional adequacy standards established by AFCO must be met or exceeded in order for a dog food to be marketed as complete and balanced for a certain life stage. Any product that does not meet the standard must be labeled for intermittent or supplemental feeding and should not be fed as a primary diet. So here, I think it's also important to know that veterinary prescription diets all have a label for them that indicate when and how they should be fed. And it is not, and I would hope most of you do not have veterinarians that would say that every single dog that you have should be on a prescription GI diet to prevent diarrhea or other nutritional uh, issues. A food should be fed according to label directions. Now, snacks and treats do not have to contain an AFCO designation, but most of them do say this is intended as a treat only. Many of them also say do not exceed X number. I have Labradors who can eat until they explode. So if I let them have a box of treats, they would eat the whole box of treats. The big issue there would be 
it's not a complete food. And if they eat enough snacks and treats, obviously you can have some GI upsets or in the case of a Labrador, you can readily have an obese dog. Testing procedures. Most pet food companies rely on laboratory analysis of their food to prove that the food is complete and balanced for a certain life stage. So let me tell you, I'm gonna make up a hypothetical dog food. I'm gonna say that I have Loring Road dog food. I live on Loring Road, so I'm not beating anybody up here. And I am telling you that my Loring Road dog food contains 21% protein. Now, that 21% protein could come from multiple sources. And in fact, if you did some sophisticated chemical mashing and other things, you could get 21% protein from old shoes. Would that be a good protein source? Would it be a digestible? No. But when you have laboratory analysis, it's going to tell you what the protein content is, not source it and not digestibility. Feeding trials use a combination of the laboratory analysis of the food as well as conducting actual feeding trials. Today in veterinary medicine, we have board certified veterinary nutritionists and they all agree that feeding trials are the gold standard for nutritional completeness. Um, in Minnesota, we had a wonderful board certified nutritionist named Dr. Julie Churchill. And she did a couple of what I would call exposés for the TV stations there in Minnesota to pick what was the best food. And they did it on air and they sent all of their reporters out to buy what they best thought was the best food. And not surprisingly, and certainly there was no incentive in this way, Dr. Churchill chose a Purina product that was complete for all life stages based on feeding trials as the best food. So in a feeding trial, AFCO outlines what you have to do. You have to have a minimum of eight dogs in the trial, how long the test should last, and that depends upon what test it is. The physical exams performed by veterinarians, and then clinical observation and measurements such as weight and blood tests. In the blood test, you're going to be looking for liver enzymes, kidney factors, amount of total protein the dog has, and any abnormality um, in red cell or white cell formation. So for adult maintenance feeding trials, you need at least eight healthy dogs at least one year of age. They, it must last 26 weeks, so, which is just over six months. If the criteria are met, the food may be labeled as follows. Animal feeding tests using AFCO procedures substantiate that Loring Road dog food proves complete and balanced nutrition for adult maintenance. For adult maintenance, you need to have 18% protein and it is broken down into specific amino acid requirements. It has to have at least 5.5% and the minerals that must be included are calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sodium chloride, magnesium, iron, copper, manganese, zinc, iodine, and selenium. I want to briefly mention copper because there are people now who have concerns about copper concentrations in food. And AFCO has not changed what they recommend as the minimum. And I know there has been some discussion between AFCO and veterinary nutritionists whether that value should be changed or not. But at this point, there have been no changes to the copper requirements. Um, when AFCO has these nutrient profiles, they give a minimum and a maximum that may be in the food. Vitamins in adult maintenance foods are vitamin A, D, and E, thiamine, riboflavin. I won't read them all. You know, after vitamin E, those are all B vitamins, all water-soluble. And where that is important, vitamin A, D, and E are stored in fat cells. So excesses of those particular vitamins can be almost as bad as a deficiency. The good thing about B vitamins is if there are excesses, in general, they are eliminated in the urine. What does this mean for you? 
For good reproductive performance, females need to be kept at good weight, have adequate exercise, appropriate lighting, interactive social opportunities, and have ongoing regular parasite and infectious disease control measures. So some of the things that I would tell you is, I do run into breeders who want to keep their dog rail thin. Realize if you look back at wild canines, foxes, wolves, et cetera, nature takes care of the mama. So if the mama dog is severely malnourished, her puppies, either her pregnancy will not succeed or she will have puppies that are tiny and poorly nourished at birth because the mother isn't absolute to have puppies at all. So keep your females at reasonable weight. They do need exercise. Lighting can affect cycling, but we certainly do not have the evidence that we have in mares where we can control their estrous cycle or get them to cycle early by increasing light. The dog tends, the bitch tends to cycle twice yearly between every four and a half to eight months with the exception of Basenji, which is a very primitive breed and only cycles annually, much more like a wolf. So the peak reproductive performance for female dogs is from two to four years of age. When you breed prior to two years of age or after four, you can have smaller litters, poor mothering, and increase in utero and neonatal death. Feeding a balanced, nutritionally complete all life stages food assures that the female will have energy, minerals, and calories needed to successfully carry a litter to term. One thing I strongly recommend we talked about in utero and prior to breeding, as part of my pre-breeding workup, I recommend that the breeder have some preliminary lab work done on the female to make sure that her serum total protein is adequate. Bitches with low total protein tend to have high amounts of pregnancy failures in addition to not being good for them in general. But certainly if their total protein is under five, serum total protein is under five, they're unlikely to successfully conceive and carry and deliver a litter at term. The caloric needs of a pregnant bitch do not increase really until after the fourth week of pregnancy. A normal female, female with a good sized litter should gain 15 to 20% of her pre-pregnancy weight by term. So if I have a 60 pound Labrador female who is pregnant and I'm capable fortunately and have an ultrasound machine even in my home at this point, I would expect her to gain a minimum of 12 pounds if she's going to have nice, chubby, strong, healthy puppies. A thin female should gain closer to 30%. And again, I have encountered breeders who are absolutely adamant that their female is not going to gain any weight and they're worried that she will eat too much. During the middle of a bitch's pregnancy, as the uterus gets big, there's not a lot of room for, a, for the bitch to fill her stomach. So she needs her meals more spread out and not as, um, not as large meals one or two times a day. And during pregnancy, this food should contain at least 1,600 kilocalories of metabolizable energy per pound. By week six to eight of pregnancy, the energy requirements of the female increased by 30 to 60 percent. All of the new low, I'm sorry, newer foods contain DHA, which help with development of the puppy's nervous system. I get call questions all the time. What supplements should I use? Should I add this? Should I add that? When you are feeding a good quality, all life stages food, you should not need any supplementation. That being said, if you have a female that is a poor eater, my first recommendation would be, she's not a very good choice in a breeding program at all. 
But if you really feel that you need that female, then you need to tempt her appetite by adding some canned dog food, some cooked human meat, or something like beef or chicken broth to make the food more palatable. Large breed puppy food should not be fed to pregnant bitches due to the adjustments made to certain nutrients. So that means my Labradors are all on Purina Pro Plan Performance 3020. I don't change it at any point. I don't feed them large breed puppy food and Labradors are large breed because that is not, some of the nutrients there are not appropriate for pregnant females. Underweight females have increased embryo loss. You may or may not know that after ovulation, the fetus doesn't implant into the uterus until about day 21. In the olden days, before we had ultrasonography, a lot of times we thought that females just quote missed. But the reality is there is a significant amount of resorption or early pregnancy loss that does go in on in the canine. Oops. Give me just a second. You're now seeing why, what happens into, oh, we'll get there in a second. Okay, next one. Underweight females have abnormal fetal development. If you have uh, decreases in certain vitamins and minerals, you are likely to have issues. If you really have really low vitamin B, you, it can contribute to cleft palates. You can have spontaneous abortions or stillbirths, small litters, low birth weight. And I want you to spell a common sense. Newborn puppies should not lose weight. Newborn humans always lose weight and that's considered normal. But a newborn puppy that loses 10% of more of its birth weight will result in death of the puppy unless you start supplementing early on. Supplements. And all life stage food does not need any supplementation. What about CalD or any of these calcium supplements or all of these products that are sold in all of the catalogs? Calcium should not be supplemented during pregnancy because it results in serum calcium levels that do not allow the female to mobilize calcium from her bones. And so that actually increases the risk for eclampsia. In the normal pregnant female, <clears throat> some of the calcium from her bone is mobilized and it keeps her serum calcium levels high. There may be a benefit and there's no harm in supplementing brachycephalics like Frenchies, Boston's pugs with five milligrams of folic acid daily to decrease neural tube abnormalities and cleft, cleft pellets. Folic acid, again, is a B vitamin. It is wise to select for females that maintain good appetite. Pregnancy toxemia is associated with a relative lack of carbohydrate in the diet and can be seen with sustained lack of appetite. So in pregnancy toxemia, the bitch cannot take care of the waste products that the puppies are producing. They develop, if we were actually measuring blood pressure, very high blood pressure, are very, very sick, and pregnancy toxemia can result in the death of the female. Again, inappropriate nutrition can result in a female having gestational diabetes much like humans can have if their diet is inadequate or if there is an underlying condition. So for these females, I recommend small frequent meals, chicken broth or similar taste enhancer will help these females continue to eat. A little known trick, not nutritionally sound, but it works. A little tiny bit of cat food on top of dog food makes cat, dogs go crazy. And I'm talking about a little tiny bit. I'm talking about a tablespoon of cat food to a bowl of dog food for a Labrador sized dog. So let's talk a bit now about natural remedies. 
And so we've talked a little bit about how important it is that the female be fed so that she can make her puppies grow and be well. When puppies are born, they should be immediately strong and viable, and they should be within the parameters for the birth weight for the breed. If they're little or if they're skinny, it is likely that the female is not eating appropriately. And I hear a lot about natural remedies. People talk about rosemary and raspberry, all types of berries, et cetera, that they try that will help bitches to cycle and will make them more fertile. You need to know there's no QC or standard for labeling of any over-the-counter supplements or herbal remedies available for purchase. These products are required by law to say this product is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease. Many of them contain none of the products they have on the label and worse, don't label what is actually in the product. There are no control studies demonstrating efficacy or safety. A number of years ago, Consumer Reports, which I happen to be a big fan of, did a whole testing section on over-the-counter supplements for joints in human beings. And they were looking at glucosamine and chondroitin. So they bought a number of these products and sent them to an outside laboratory researching them. Some of them contained none of what was in the label. Some of them contained more, many of them contained less. But the big issue was if there is no outside testing to verify what's in it, you really don't know. Any one of you could set up a natural remedy lab or a new product that you're gonna sell. Here we're gonna say Loring Road sells a product that guarantees I can get promises that you will increase your litter size by two puppies. And I could make that in my bathtub. No one would necessarily have to check it and I could market it. And if someone bought it, as long as it was labeled, that would be legal. So this, I really worked hard to try to get a slide of this. This is actually a dog food label. Maybe our helpers here can make it larger, but if you look at the guaranteed analysis, it's going to show you the percentage of what that is in each product, and it will have the AFCO label. And the label down here, uh, let's see if I can read it. Too small for me to read, but we will talk about that label. That constitutes the bulk of feed. So what, what you feed during pregnancy and what you feed to your baby puppies also determines, affects their hormones as they grow and affects their growth rates. So if they are fed inappropriately, they will not cycle at the time that you expect to, them to cycle and they will not cycle on a regular basis. So I think that this is a good time for Dr. Ritter, are you our, our ringleader for the questions or how do we handle questions now? <laughs> I sure am. Uh, thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, like we mentioned previously, we are focusing on the questions that were submitted uh, prior to the lecture, uh, but we have reviewed ones that have been submitted and we'll get to those if we have time. Um, so Dr. Smith will jump right in. And I know you mentioned a lot of these during your presentation, but always nice to review. Um, what diet do you recommend for breeding animals? And are there any specific ingredients to avoid? Uh, we have a lot of questions with people, you know, a little leery of some of the ingredients that pop up on that list, um, wondering what, what should be avoided. Okay. First of all, you cannot go wrong feeding Carina Pro Plan Performance all life stages. Any of the Purina All Life Stages food is, are great. They are perfectly nutritionally balanced. I think one of the concerns that people often have is that, the, um, is that they're worried about preservatives. Today's preservatives are absolutely safe. In the few, in the, in the experiments or trials that have been done, to see what preservatives are not. Realize that testing is done primarily in rats and mice. 
and it is fed at the level of a number of years ago, people were worried about ephoxyquin. Ephoxyquin is not in the renus preservative. So get that out of your head. Don't worry about it. But there was huge concern in the dog community about ephoxyquin. The study that was done measured the effect of ephoxyquin on pregnancy in rodents. And what they found was it definitely affected reproduction. But if you were to correlate the amount of ephoxyquin that the rodent got to a dog or a human, the human or the dog would have to have eaten 20 pounds of ephoxyquin to have those effects. So it really did not apply. So there's no concern about any of the nutrients in the Purina foods. Great. Thank you. Um, another kind of interesting question for breeding dogs, and I know you mentioned prescription diets as it relates to maybe GI uh, upset. Um, for dogs, for breeding dogs that are on long-term prescription diets, should they transition to a different diet, uh, particularly during gestation? So that's a really good question and a very difficult question. Again, being a bit of a purist myself, if a dog needs a prescription diet, unless you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was due to some event. Let's just say a dog has some kidney damage because it got into antifreeze. Um, that dog might need a renal diet forever. There are two issues there. First of all, it may ha not have enough ki normal kidney function to support a pregnancy, but if there was not an event, you don't want to select for dogs that have poor absorption of nutrients or kidney or liver function and need a prescription diet so that they can function well. And I think that is particularly important. And I think you will agree, Dr. Ritter, that for dogs that have allergies, if your dog needs a hypoallergenic or single protein diet to not itch itself to death, you should not be breeding that dog. Um, the American College of Veterinary Dermatology has a very strong statement regarding that. And they strongly believe that atopic allergic dogs should not be bred. It is highly heritable. And I will tell you in 40 plus years as a veterinarian, if there's any disease process that frustrates owners who are your puppy buyers more, it's chronic skin disease. It never gets well. It gets better and worse and better and worse. No, certainly true. Definitely some of the more frustrating cases for both, like you said, the practitioner and the owner. Um, another question, and I know you touched on this during your lecture. Um, can you talk to us about hypocalcemia and, and how to go about avoiding it? Sure. The best thing with hypocalcemia is make sure your females have steady weight gain that they are feeding in all life stages food because the calcium and phosphorus is ideally balanced. If you are so motivated that you feel you must supplement, and it makes us feel good when our dogs are just thrilled about what they're getting, you can supplement with something, not a supplement supplement, but a little bit of cooked chicken, a little bit of cooked beef, something like that, as long as it is no more than 10%. But when you add the calcium supplements, it upsets the calcium phosphorus balance. And the bitches actually end up with low serum calcium, which tends to make them have eclampsia. And it's not just because they have big litters and they're producing a lot of milk. It's just because their calcium phosphorus balance got out of whack during pregnancy. And usually those bitches are also thin and have big litters. Great. Um, another question, not necessarily only for pregnant animals, but can you talk a little bit about the relationship between um, dilated cardiomyopathy and certain diets? I know that's a little bit more recent, um, but. Sure, absolutely. Within the last, I'm going to say five or six years, I'm old now, so it might be a little longer than that. All of a sudden, we had an increase in cardiomyopathy, which is a disease of the heart where the heart muscle is failing and not working appropriately. Um, that disease had been common in a few breeds. Primarily, I would say some of the 
Cocker Spaniel breeds, et cetera. But they were seeing it much more and the Golden Retriever Club of America, which has a very active health education arm, helped to get funding to determine what was going on. And what was determined that in some dogs that were probably on some basis gen genetically predisposed, the taurine levels in the dog food were either inadequate or the dog itself had a metabolic defect where it did not absorb and utilize taurine appropriately. So there are taurine supplements potentially available. I would not supplement taurine in a dog that has not been diagnosed with cardiomyopathy and is not under the care of a cardiologist. Great. Thank you. Um, another good question. Is there any connection between prenatal nutrition and dystocia? Yes, there is indirectly. Um, the biggest thing is, again, if the bitch is really undernourished and she has a singleton puppy, odds of a singleton puppy causing a dystocia are very high. What actually causes labor to begin in the female is release of the hormone cortisol from the puppy's adrenal glands. And the puppies do that in response to crowding. So as you can imagine, for example, in a Labrador, if she has one puppy, which likely at birth is gonna weigh a pound, it's never gonna feel very crowded in that great big belly. So they don't tend to get all the signals they need to have good, strong labor. You might have a toy breed female that will be able to successfully whelp a singleton puppy. But my recommendations in my clinic and for all of my career were, and still are, if you have a litter with one puppy, plan on a timed C-section. A timed C-section is the best outcome for the mama and the puppy. So small litter size, large litter size, which means you've been feeling them really, really well, but large litter size, females tend to run out of steam by the end of their labor. An average whelping, in my opinion, should take about an hour a puppy. So if you have 10 puppies, that's 10 hours of labor. If you have 12 pu out puppies, that's 12 hours of labor. And a lot of females are just exhausted after six or seven hours. And then they have what we call secondary uterine inertia. So huge litters, small litters are the two biggest things. Um, and surprisingly, even if you have a singleton puppy at birth, the size of the puppy usually is not responsible for a dystocia. Many times birth defects, such as walrus or water puppies, the brachycephalic people call them, they are too large to pass through the birth canal. Awesome, thank you. Um, a couple of questions here. You've spoke at length about all stage food diets. Um, I think this is important to, to go over again. I know you mentioned in your presentation, but your thoughts on supplementation. Um, we have so many people reach out regarding vitamins, folic acid, what have you. Um, if you could just go over again for everybody, your, sure, your thoughts. Absolutely. On absolutely. In general, unless you know you have a specific requirement, give them nothing extra. As I say, there is one study in brachycephalics indicating that five milligrams of folic acid may help to prevent neural tube issues and cleft palates. But barring that, all supplements disrupt the already balanced nutrients that are in the food that you're feeding. <clears throat> so unless you're a nutritionist sitting there with your computer generated spreadsheet figuring out how much of this and how much you have to de de decrease of that, supplements don't help and often hurt. I do think we should really talk about, and I think it's important, and I haven't seen a question about it, I get asked all the time, what about heartworm preventative during pregnancy? And the heartworm preventatives are labeled for use in pregnant animals and also in stud dogs and have been proven safe. That being said, 
flea and tick products, it is critically important that you read the labels because many of them say right on the label, this product has not been proven safe in reproducing or nursing dogs or in breeding animals. But heartworm preventative should always be continued. Our today heartworm preventatives also help to prevent internal parasites and realize many of the internal parasites can be transmitted in utero to the puppies even before they're born. So they're very safe and failure to do so can be not a good thing. Yeah, I think a very good point. Preventative medication, really important. Review those labels. Uh, you can find them if you Google uh, the product that you're utilizing uh, and the label. You'll be able to find they have safety profiles you're able to read underneath that, um, whether it could impact your your animal and, and intended uses. Um, fantastic. We have just time for a couple more questions, I think. Um, one of them being, should plasma be offered to puppies? And if so, how? Okay. So plasma is a portion of dog's blood. Um, you have to have a centrifuge to harvest plasma. And it is typically given to puppies who are colostrum deprived. Colostrum is the first milk or fluid that a female produces at the end of her pregnancy and is rich in antibodies. The puppy's GI tract can only absorb antibodies for max 48 hours. So if you have a female that has a C-section and for some reason the puppies cannot nurse at all, plasma is an option. In my opinion, the safest way to give it is orally and you need to get specific instructions from your veterinarian as to how much and how often but there is no benefit to giving plasma orally after 48 hours. And there is some concern, although low, of perhaps having adverse reactions with plasma use if you take plasma from a donor animal that is not the mother. So it's not a be all end all. And I will also tell you it takes very little plasma for the puppies to get antibodies. If you can get a half a mil of colostrum into a puppy, they get a huge amount of antibodies in that. It's not a volume factor. It's the antibodies that the mom already has, which is another reason all of your breeding dogs should be kept current on vaccinations. And I am not a believer in distemper combinations every three years for breeding dogs because you are going to have a fall off in antibodies they give their baby. Oh, I think a really good point. Um, fantastic, well, we have time for, we'll do one more and then pass it back to Nicole here. Um, could you offer any insight into milk production post-pregnancy? Um, how should one address if they encounter any issues with this? Okay, that's a really good question. Milk production is based on two things. It's an increase in a hormone called prolactin. And also milk release is influenced by oxytocin. So the most important thing, if you have decreased milk production post whelping, increase the palatability of the food, make sure the female is getting lots of water, give the puppies plenty of opportunities to nurse because nursing causes oxytocin release. And you can increase prolactin by having your veterinarian help you with a drug called metoclopramide. It is also a GI stimulant, but it causes a prolactin boost. And many times you can get a female to produce milk by giving her metoclopramide. And interesting aside, because of my specialty, I do uh, a bunch of pro bono work for different zoos. And I worked with a tigress who had no milk and they were beside themselves. So we had them give her metoclopramide, beef up her diet literally with beef. And she started to produce a ton of milk and to take care of her baby. Prolactin also increases the, the female's desire to mother. So it has lots of benefits if you give metoclopramide. You are not gonna be able to get that product on your own and you should not be getting it on your own 
this requires veterinary help. Yes, please, please work with your veterinarians uh, yes. here to help. Um, fantastic. Well, Dr. Smith, that was awesome. Uh, thank you so much for your time and, and your willingness to help educate our community here. Uh, Nicole, I'll, I'll leave it to you to take us away. Awesome. Yeah, thank you again, Dr. Smith. This was an amazing presentation. I learned so much um, based on the comments on Facebook. It sounds like our community learned so much as well. So we can't thank you enough for being here. And thank you to our audience today for asking such amazing questions and engaging with this content. We are so happy to be able to present it to you. Um, before I let everybody go, I just want to share two more reminders because you know, the events at Good Dog don't stop here. Um, we recently announced that we have our third annual health symposium coming up all throughout the month of October. These are completely virtual and free events for any dog breeders, dog lovers. Um, so you don't have to be a member of Good Dog to join them. Um, and the first session will begin on Wednesday, October 4th at 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, and it will be about using serial progesterone measurements in breeding management. So the entire theme of this year's health symposium is all about improving the reproductive health of our breeding dogs. So very on theme with today's presentation. Um, so we would love to have you join us for all of those sessions throughout October. Again, they're virtual, they're free, they're open to anybody. So we will drop a registration link in the chat for you to make sure you register for those events. And we will be right back here tomorrow on Facebook Live at 12 p.m. Eastern for our weekly coffee chat where we just summarize all of the latest and greatest that is happening in the good dog community. So that will be tomorrow and we'll share a bunch of reminders there as well of all of the things that are coming up. So just wanted to share that with everybody um, before we let everyone go. And thank you again for joining us. If you aren't a member of our community, we would absolutely love to have you apply to join at gooddog.com slash join, which we'll drop again in the chat so everyone has it. Um, so you can stay up to date on all future webinars and content just like this. And yeah, we will see you next time at our next webinar. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you for having me. It was lots of fun. Of course.